you don't lose heart. People tell me, well, what do you love about Peru? And I said, well, it's not Disneyland, which isn't even that great of a place anymore. But I said, we love the people. I love seeing that happen in the life of other people. That's why we're there. We don't lose heart because even if we're perishing on the outside, God is bringing life into us, but it's not just for us. It's for other people. God wants to use your life to bring life into other people. And as he brings difficulty and death into your life, it's going to transform you into the image of Christ. But don't lose heart when there is difficulty because God wants to use that to bring life into others. I love missions conferences. I love just gathering together with like-minded people who love the Lord and want to serve him all over the world. So it's already been just an awesome uh, you know, day or so with all of you and seeing so many friends. And um, we've been talking about the call of God. That's been kind of the theme. And it was amazing to see just the history. I mean, um, you know, Sharon's and her parents, like a hundred years almost of history of faithful ministry. So it was awesome. And you know, I received my calling um, actually in Chile as well at uh, the Bible college that Golden Springs used to run in Chile. And it was a mission trip that I honestly wasn't interested in going on. Um, my pastor uh, at the time, there was a, a big earthquake. The Chileans, I'm sure, remember the big earthquake in Concepcion and Talcahuano. And we wanted to go and help. And my, my pastor invited me to go on this trip. And I said, no because I wanted to go to Southern California because that's where everything was happening with Calvary Chapel, you know? If you wanted to serve the Lord in Calvary Chapel, you came to Southern California. And uh, he encouraged me, you know, I just think it'd be good for you. It'd be good for you. And so I decided to go. And during that time, I fell in love with Chile. I fell in love with South America. And God clearly called me to serve him on the mission field. And so you never know. You never know when God is going to begin to move in your heart and begin to speak to you about what it is that he has for your life and what he's calling you to do. So with that, if you guys will open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, I put a title for the, the sermon today that would be Seeing the Eternal. And as we think about the calling, um, my heart and my, my hope for this is that we would begin to have God's heart and God's eyes. Um, I'm sure many of you know Jonathan Edwards, the, 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 the great preacher from the Great Awakening. He said, Lord, stamp my eyes with eternity. He said, please let me see everything that I do on this earth through the lens of eternity. That this life is so short, but that eternity is truly forever. And that every decision, the way that I live my life, would be filtered through the reality that the things that we can touch and feel and see are temporary, but the things that we cannot see, the soul of a person, the calling of God, heaven itself, the things we can't see are the things that are going to be eternal. And that is how we should live as a Christian. And that especially is how we should live as missionaries. So will you please read with me? Uh, I'm just gonna read three verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18, and then we'll get into this. It says... Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Lord, thank you for the messages that we've heard, for the fellowship that we have had, Lord. And we know that you are here amongst us, Lord. We know that you hear our prayers, God. And we, we also know that you have a calling on our lives to follow you, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to teach the word of God, everything that you have commanded. And I just pray this morning, now, as we get into your word, that you would speak to us regarding to the reality of eternity, that you would help us, Lord, to let go 
of, of the grip we might have on the temporal things and begin to truly see the world and see people and see our own lives in the light of eternity, the way that you see them, Lord. So please, God, we just ask, Lord, that you would come and that you would meet us this morning because we need you. Lord, we ask that you, we would just, we need a a touch from heaven, God. And I pray that you would encourage the missionaries and the ministers that are here, that you would strengthen them, Lord, as we often do grow weary. But may your word strengthen us. May it encourage us. May it establish us. And I pray for those that are maybe thinking about the mission field, Lord, that you would speak to their heart in a very personal way, that they would know that their Father in heaven is speaking from the throne regarding their life. So God, we just ask for your blessing, and we trust that you will speak to us, Lord, but we, we want to hear from you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we think about the Apostle Paul, sometimes he can seem like this machine, this missionary apostle. You know, he couldn't be stopped. And that's true. I mean, as we watch his life, he truly was someone who was unstoppable. But he was not a machine. He was a human being. And he had all of the same thoughts and feelings that that we might have. He was actually a sensitive man in a lot of ways that felt the pain and the grief and the arrows of different situations and different people. We often see him mourning and rejoicing. We see Paul uh, rejoicing when when he would hear good news of the churches. You know, I I think of when he hears of good news of the church in Thessalonica, he he burst out into praise. Um, he, He was concerned for their spiritual warfare. So he went spiritual well-being, excuse me. So he was a man who was unstoppable, but he went through all of these difficulties, but he continually sticks to the work. He continues, continues to move forward. He faces every difficulty, every um, danger, and he never seems to flinch. Not for a single moment do we see him thinking, you know, maybe I should retreat from this. Maybe I shouldn't follow this calling that God has placed on my life. He was steadfast in moving forward with God's calling on his life, no matter what he encountered, whether he was stoned or in prison. I think what hurt him the most was when he would be criticized in the churches that he planted. He was, he was hurt. He was concerned for how they were doing. But he could say, as we see in Acts, that none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself. So he says here, therefore, we do not lose heart. And obviously, as good Bible students, when we see the word therefore, we need to understand what happened before. And and honestly, studying through 2 Corinthians is such a personal look into the life of Paul. But but starting in the the beginning of the book, really in chapter 1 through chapter 7, you get this really amazing look into Paul's life. And what he is saying right there, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. And when we talk about losing heart, first, we're going to talk about what that looks like. And then we're going to look at the therefore, you know, why didn't he lose heart? Um, But we see that he went through so much in ministry, um, stoning, imprisonments, rejection, earthly loss. But what does it mean to lose heart? The, the, The phrase there in the Greek, it means to be utterly spiritless. It means to be wearied out. It means to be exhausted, and it can even mean to fall into bad behavior, to fail in heart, to faint, to be weary. Paul says, we're, gonna get, we, we, we're going to get tired, but we do not lose heart. And it's not the first time he says it in this chapter. He actually says it again in the beginning of chapter 4 in verse 1, where he says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. I don't know about you guys, for those of you who have served on the mission field or served in ministry, there's been many times where I felt like I was close to losing heart. And when I look at the life of Paul, I would love to hear a Bible study from the Apostle Paul on what kept him going, what made him tick, what was it that that caused him to continue to move forward. And that's really what we're going to, to see. But you can just kind of imagine like if the Apostle Paul came walking down in here and he was gonna teach at our missions conference and he had the scars and he was hobbling and he said, let me tell you about what kept me moving forward. We would all wanna hear what he has to say. And that's what we're going to, to see today. How is it that we can keep from throwing in the towel, losing courage or fainting or becoming work or becoming weary? to be discouraged to the point 
of quitting? Why didn't he just take some time off? Why didn't he stop? And he, and he says, because we have this ministry, because we have this mercy. So if you go back to chapter three, he talks about the ministry of the spirit, this new covenant. He says, who is sufficient for these things? He says, none of us are sufficient for these things, but Christ makes us sufficient. And then he says, it's not the the ministry of the law, but now we have Jesus Christ himself. And as we look at Jesus Christ, as as we gaze upon his glory, he begins to transform us day by day. And then as you come into chapter four, he says, we have mercy from God. As we serve the Lord, he is merciful to us. But it's not just that. Then he goes on to say that we might be destroyed or cast down, but our, our, excuse me, cast down but not destroyed. We're going to be pressured, but we're not, we're not, he's not going to forsake us. We're going to go through difficulty, but God promises to be with us. And he talks about so that the light of the gospel of Christ can shine into the hearts of people and save them and transform their lives. Paul said, We don't lose heart because we have this incredible ministry that God has given us. We don't lose heart because God is going to be merciful towards us. We don't lose heart because as we do this, we understand that anything that we might suffer, what we could, you know, even one soul would be worth any amount of temporary suffering because that means I'm going to be with that person in heaven forever. And he says, although Although the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so I, as I was just thinking about losing heart, about going through difficulties and the calling that God has placed on my life in Peru, it's such an amazing ministry. It's such an amazing privilege that God allows us to take part in seeing people pass from darkness to light. I got saved at 23 years old, um, and I lived a a crazy life, and I'm not gonna give you all the details, but I I was trying to balance between drugs and alcohol and parties, but also beginning to study and being greedy for money and wanting to do all these things. And, And I remember being in college as I got saved, and it was like for the first time ever, I really knew love. The love of God as a father, it transformed my life. And then on top of that, as I got into the word of God, for the first time ever, there was something that was true. You know, everything in the world would change so quickly. Everything that you put your hope in would change so quickly. But the truth of God is forever. It never changes. And I just remember thinking to myself, I don't want to invest my life into anything else. Just as Paul said in Romans, there, you know, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because the power of God unto salvation for all that believe. There is no university, there is no philosophy, there is nothing in this world that can save someone from their sins, that can transform their heart, that can make somebody a new person, that can set somebody free from their addictions and their struggles. There is nothing in the world that can do that other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you begin to compare the sufferings and you say, you know what, this ministry that God has entrusted us, that the love of God, that the light of his gospel, that through his word and through, you know, spirit-filled people, spirit-filled Christians, that lives can be truly transformed on this earth, not even to mention that their eternal destiny, destiny is going to change. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about it. You've never met a mere mortal. He said, every single individual that we come into contact with is going to end up in one of two destinations of becoming something so horrible, something that would just make us shudder if we even see that some, you know, a demon in hell and fire that burns forever, or they're going to be in heaven and they're gonna look like something so angelic and something so beautiful that we'd be tempted to worship if we saw it. Those are the only two options for a person's life. When you begin to think about that, you say, Yes, this is difficult, but you know what? That is so much more important than anything I might suffer on this earth. And it helps me with the Apostle Paul because as I can get into my complaints and think about my life being hard, as I read about his life, it doesn't even compare. You know, it doesn't, and I don't, it's not about guilt. We don't want to guilt anybody. We all have our lot in life. But the things that Paul is going to call, the, you know, he calls these light afflictions, For me, they're a little bit more than that, okay? You know, he was stoned to death. 
You know, and then he gets up and goes straight back into the city where he was stoned. I think I'd be like, you know, I'll take a cheese break here. Might go home for a while, and then I'll think about going on to that city. But he calls them light afflictions. And as we go through, as we have this ministry, we need to see the greatness and the glory and the honor and the privilege that it is to serve the Lord, to be involved in, in people going from darkness to light. There's nothing greater that our life can be used for. And although the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed. And as you, if you were to read back in this chapter, if you, you know, the, earlier in this chapter, it would talk about the difficulties and what we go through. And we know that from different spots, obviously in the Bible, that God is going to use every difficulty in our life. As we go through things, as we've been appointed to suffer with Jesus Christ, you know, that we are always delivered to death so that the life of Christ might be manifested. And so there's a work that we can trust that every time we go through something difficult, God is going to use it for his glory. He's going to use it to create a Christ-likeness in us. As Christians, as children of God, we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his, his, his purpose and his promise. And that can give us this great rest and understanding that, you know what, God is going to use this difficulty, but we know that. But it's not even just about that. As the outward man is perishing and the inward man is being renewed, it's not just for our own benefit. It is also for the benefit of others. So as we go through these difficulties and it, and it can feel crushing, what God wants to do is to use that to bring life into others. There's a, there's a couple that were in my church, and his name is Angel, and his wife's name is Jenny. It's actually not. It's a Venezuelan name that's very difficult. You know, it's hard for Hector to say words in English. I do the same thing, but in Spanish. And uh, I couldn't say her name right, so she let me call her Jenny. It's uh, Jenny Reth, actually. I, I can say it now. But when I met them, they were Venezuelan immigrants. They had left their country because the people were starving and there was no medicine and it was so challenging. And they came to Peru and they were living in a garage and uh, they, Angel had spent a year in the Dominican Republic and it went horrible. He, won't, he still won't, won't really talk to me about what happened in the Dominican Republic other than it was the worst year of his life as an immigrant. Um, and they started coming to my church and it's a long story. They weren't actually married. They had just been living together for a long time. They called themselves Christian and they sit in the front row on a Wednesday night, and there are Christians who aren't married, and I'm teaching out of 1 Corinthians. And I'm like, well, they're never coming back, you know. But I said, hey, if this is you, if you're, you know, don't even have, don't even have a meal with them if they're calling themselves Christians and living in sin, you know. Um, I said, if that's you, please come and talk to me, because I really would love to help you. You know, I'd love to see you get your life on track. And praise God, they came to me, and they are the ones who, really pioneered. I, I pastor a church in Peru, Calvary Trujillo, and I run Calvary Bible Institute Peru. And they were the ones who pioneered that because they came to our church. They started to grow. I said, you guys need to get married. And they said, we could never afford a wedding. She didn't believe, the wife didn't believe that she could get married because they had suffered and struggled so much. It was just an impossible thing that they'd be able to pay even just for the paperwork and for the, and for the, you know, the ceremony. And I said, we'll help you. We'll do it. We can do it right here in the church. You know, and we had a tiny church at the time, but we did it and it was beautiful and they got married. And then they became our first students and they graduated and they started a Bible study that has turned into a church. And now Angel is pastoring a church that is about 90% Venezuelan refugees. But I remember when I first met them, she said, well, I'll never have children. We could never ever imagine having children. It's just, she said, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. I was like, what? Why would you not want to have children? And it was just their life had been so difficult. They never, they couldn't imagine bringing another person into this world. Like, it just, that's not for us. And they were firm in that. And then after they graduated and started their church, they said, we're trying to have a baby. And then they came and said, we're having a baby. And I said, is his name Corey? And I said, no. And I said, darn it, you know, it's Nathaniel. And uh, I met with them right before I came here and she's eight months pregnant, you know, and, and just got to sit with them and pray with them. And I said, you remember when you guys came here and you didn't even think you guys would, could even get married and now you're married and you're pastoring a church and you're about to have a baby. 
you have all these beautiful people that you're discipling and, and this beautiful church and family in Christ. I said, you know, we've gone through so much. My wife and I have suffered so much, but it was death in us, but life in them. You know, our, <laughs> we don't lose heart. People tell me, well, what do you love about Peru? And I said, well, it's not Disneyland, <laughs> which isn't even that great of a place anymore, but... I said, we love the people. I love seeing that happen in the life of other people. That's why we're there. We don't lose heart because even if we're perishing on the outside, God is bringing life into us, but it's not just for us. It's for other people. God wants to use your life to bring life into other people. And as he brings difficulty and death into your life, it's gonna transform you into the image of Christ. But don't lose heart when there is difficulty because God wants to use that to bring life into others. And another reason that Paul says we don't lose heart, he said there in verse, verse one of the chapter, is because we receive mercy. And I just, we need mercy, guys. We need mercy. Even of, of the pastors, we're up here teaching. We make, I make mistakes every single day, a lot of them. Ask my wife, you know. It's a, it's, it's a lot. And sometimes I have made, uh, things have happened that have been so horrible where I really thought, I don't think I should be a pastor anymore. Um, I'm supposed to be helping people. About three or four years ago, uh, my assistant pastor left and it wasn't, a, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. And it's a long story, uh, but his wife was kind of attacking my wife and they were not being honest and they were doing a lot of things. And it, and it turned into this meeting and his wife began to attack my wife and I raised my voice. I wasn't too extreme, but it was definitely more loud than it needed to be. And that was almost like what they were looking for, that, that I was the bad guy, that see, Corey's not a good pastor and we're out of here. I loved this guy like a brother. We had been together from the beginning. And I walked away from that meeting and I told my wife, I said, I don't know if I should do this. I mean, I'm supposed to help people. This, I'm not, obviously, obviously, I'm not helping anybody right here. Look at their little lives. That's not helpful, you know. And she was very upset. She said, but they did this, this, and this, and this, and the other. And I said, yeah, that's true. But the Lord gave me, uh, when Moses, you know, he strikes the rock. You guys remember that story, right? The people of Israel, they were rebellious, weren't they? They were not easy people. They were presumptuous. They were sinful. They were complainers. He, Moses was right. When he said, you rebels, they were rebels. But that's not what God had called him to do. That was not how God had called him to represent him to his people. And because he lost his temper in that one moment, he didn't go into the promised land. And I said, Daniel, you're right about all of that, but I still can't do that. I still sinned. And, I, and I, I'm, that's, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I'm here. And God had to come and just tell me, Corey, yes, you failed. But my mercies are new every morning. He said, I still love you. You're still called. And I didn't lose heart because I know that I have a God who loves me and is merciful to me. And so as Paul, as we start to study, Paul says, we don't lose heart because we're merciful. And then he, he continues on with this thought. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's incredible that Paul calls it light affliction. Because as we read his story, I mean, he was just, we already talked about it. He went through so much stones and shipwrecks and everything else. But the key to him being able to say it was light affliction is that he understood that it was only for a moment. And this life is only for a moment. And if this life is truly only for a moment, then we shouldn't overreact or get upset or throw in the towel whether something is really terrible or, something, or if something is really great. Uh, I just flew here from, I got here yesterday from Peru, and the first flight is 40 minutes. Um, I really don't care where I sit on that flight because as soon as we get up in the air, we're coming back down. I mean, they don't serve you any snacks. They maybe give you water if they get here in time, but you know what? It really doesn't matter because it's so short. 
that whether I'm in the middle of two giants or whether I have the whole front row to myself, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's like, it's just, it's gonna be over like that. Now, the next flight was an eight hour red eye from Lima to LAX, and I'm not gonna lie, I was trying to figure out how to upgrade because I knew I had to be here yesterday. I couldn't, I, I was very upset and sad. But the reality is that this life in comparison to eternity is shorter than that 40 minute flight from Trujillo to Lima. And whatever we go through on this earth, it's just so quick. I mean, whatever thing we could suffer, whatever sickness, whatever difficulty, Paul said, you know, it doesn't matter if I stay in the, in, in the dungeon of Nero or in the palace of Nero, because it's all so quick in comparison to what's going to happen in eternity. And all of it is going to work as I serve the Lord. It's going to have this weight of glory. People were getting saved. They were passing from darkness to light. Like I'm gonna be rejoicing in heaven with all of the multitudes and every tribe and every tongue. And, and I get to see people that I minister. They're gonna be in heaven with me. This, this weight of glory that, that there's people dying and they're either going to heaven or hell. That is so much more important. Why would I worry about this temporary light quick affliction. But unfortunately, today, especially in this world, I mean, we live in crazy times. It's the end times, but they're the most comfortable times in history. You know, even, even our, our houses and our cars and our restaurants were like not as better than what kings had just a few hundred years ago, you know. But unfortunately, we spend all of our effort and all of our concern and all of our, our work on that 40 minute flight that is over in the blink of an eye, when in fact we have eternity to look forward after that. I don't wanna spend my entire life living for something that is so short. And I also, whatever I have to go through, whatever I have to suffer, it's gonna be quick. It really doesn't matter. I want to live for the Lord. I want to live for the things of, of eternity. Spurgeon said, whatever pain and suffering I may endure, it does not compare with the joy in heaven when one sinner converts. He said, my casual lot shall be my well-contented choice. It shall be a matter of not cool indifference, but of calm serenity, because it will soon be over and gone into history. And then he says this, and I want you guys to hear this. He says, be not children in knowledge, but quit yourselves as men. As to the things of this life, look on them as toys. Do not act towards them as children do, but as men. Oh, says the young man, I have taken my degree at the university today, and he exults. What high importance he attaches to it. He wishes to get a newspaper so he might see it there. It's a, to him an event as great as anything in history. But we perhaps are rather amused at his excitement for we do not consider it anything of this sort much worthy of marking down. He says, don't be attached to these things that are so quick. They, they, they pass so soon. But may we have the conviction that Paul had that he writes down in verses 13 and 14. In 13, he says, and since we have the same spirit of faith according to that what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. Paul says, we have the, I have the same spirit of faith. We have the same spirit of faith. We believe and we speak knowing that the Lord Jesus will raise us up, that we are going to pass eternity with him. I mean, the things going on in the world, Jesus could come back at any moment and we are going to see him face to face. And we are going to pass eternity with him. What Paul is saying is, I have been gripped by the spirit of faith and it has become a conviction that God who raises the dead, who raised Jesus Christ, will raise me as well. And that's the, that's the, the, the reality that we want to be gripped with. That one day I am going to meet God and that day is coming very, very soon. I am going to see him face to face. I am going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're all going to stand there. 
So I'm willing to suffer. I'm thankful for the suffering. I'm thankful for the work that it's done in me and in others. But at the end of the day, I want to know and have this deep realization and deep conviction. It's gonna sound so obvious, but it needs to be said that God is real and that eternity is a very long time. And that everything that I do in this life is going to be based upon that conviction. Oswald Chambers, you know, my utmost for his highest, he said he had a Bible school and his goal was that all of his students would live as if God was real. Because if God is true and God is real, that will change everything about the way we live. It will allow us to push past the difficulties as we know it's him and say, you know what, whatever happens in this earth, I am willing to go through it. If we believe that God is real, and that we're going to spend eternity with him or without him if we don't have Christ. If we embrace those two realities, how different would we live? How much more seriously would we take the call to go into the world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples here in California, in the United States, in South America, and to the ends of the earth? There's billions of people all over this world that need Jesus. And God has chosen to use his children as the channel and the method to go and bring them the message of salvation. And is it gonna be difficult? Yes. We have been promised, we've been promised and appointed to suffer as Christ has suffered. But he will use that for good and the glory of the ministry, the glory of what God will do in our life is so much greater. And we need to have those in the right balance. A couple years ago, I was diagnosed with liver cancer. Two doctors told me you have cancer in your liver, come back to the United States right away. And I began to weep uncontrollably because as far as I could tell, liver cancer is basically a death sentence. I have four small children, the beautiful wife, and I was thinking my children are gonna grow up without their dad. And <laughs> it depends on who you ask. You know, I know Gerald's out there. He's convinced I was healed in the airplane. Um, but I came to the United States and they did all this testing and, they, and, they, and, and they, after four, four months they said, the oncologist said, there's nothing I can do for you. You don't have cancer. That was very scary. And during that time, we were given a lot of opportunities to do other things. And I was actually beginning to like some of those ideas. And my wife looks me in the eyes and she goes, yeah, we could do that. But we've always just done whatever Jesus said, right? And I said, that's right. That's right. Whatever Jesus says, that's what we want to do. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. That's what matters. And so to close this out today, I want to, I want to look at verse 18. It says, While we, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul, everything he went through, he said this is the key right here. We don't look at the things that we can see. Those things are temporary. But we look at the things we but the things which are not seen because they are eternal. It's like everything that we can see in this room, everything in our life, every possession, everything we can touch, everything here is temporary. None of this is going to last. We can spend our whole life on building things in this earth and when we die, it's gone. We take none of it with us. And one day, it's all gonna melt away anyways. None of this is going to last. None of things permanent, but because we can see it, it becomes the most important thing in our life. Paul said the key to following the Lord, to following the call is stop looking at the, the things that, are, that you can see. Those things are not, and when we say look, the idea is to focus or don't make it the scope of your life. Don't make it the thing you focus on because it's temporary. We can build so many things in this life, but it's all gonna go away. But the things that we can't see, the soul of a person, the call of God, heaven and hell, those things will go on forever. Those are the things that we need to live for. Paul says we must look to the eternal thing. Think about the things Paul writes. Do you ever hear Paul talking about the, the comfort or the beauty of the house he was staying in? Do you ever hear him talking about, you know, the, 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 the best vacation spots in Greece? No, hey, I mean, I'm, I, I love vacation. I'm not saying you don't take a vacation. I'm just saying he didn't, he didn't, those weren't the things that filled his heart and mind. 
The things that filled his heart and mind was how people received the Lord, how people stayed steadfast in the Lord, how they repented from sin and turned to the living God. Those were the things he looked at. Those were the things that mattered to him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, don't seek after all the things of the world, the things that the Gentiles seek. He says, what you can wear, what you can eat, where you'll stay, that's what the the world seeks after. You don't worry about that. You seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and I will take care of that and you will live for something that is true and that is purposeful, that is eternal, the things that really, really matter. And I remember being in that college and I was studying and I was thinking I was gonna get a degree in finance and I just said, Lord, I don't wanna live for things that don't matter. And I went into this office and, and he was my friend and I was, a, I, w- I was not Christian the semester before and now I was this on fire crazy person. And uh, the counselor, um, he, was, he was a friend of mine and he was like, Are, you wanna do what? You wanna go to a Bible college? I said, yeah. He goes, well, it's accredited, right? I said, no. He goes, Are you sure? And I said, I've never been more sure of anything in my life. I have finally found something that matters. I could spend my whole life gathering things for myself here and there would still be an emptiness, but I have finally found the one true God who loves me. And and I have found something that will matter for eternity. And that is the only thing that I wanna live for. And sometimes there's tough choices. Sometimes we know if we decide to live for the things that are eternal, we might lose something that we don't want to lose. Um, I live in Trujillo, Peru. It's the most beautiful place on earth. Look it up. There's a couple of laughs because people have been there. There's beautiful parts. It's a desert. Uh, it's the highest UV rating, one of the highest in the world. If, I'm, if I look pink, my skin is now permanently red from the sunburns I've gotten. Um, but we do have a nice ocean. Um, I don't like hot weather at all. I have friends here who love to make fun of me because it'll be like 72 and I'm like, wow, it's really hot. And they're like, You're, what's the matter with you, you know? Um, what I call home is Fort Bragg, California, Mendocino Coast. If any of you know it, that truly is the most beautiful place on earth. A hot day there is about 63 degrees. They start to sweat if it gets to 70. Um, we have redwood forests and oceans. It's a, it's a beautiful place. I, I, I love it there. And when God called me to the mission field, he called me down to Peru and I ended up in Trujillo in this desert. It wasn't what I had in mind. And when I left, um, my grandmother basically raised me and she begged me to stay. And she said, I don't want you to go. She said, really, the rest of this family is kind of crazy. You're the only one that I trust. And that's true for my family. And it hurt me. It hurt me to hear her say those words. Um, And then because I wasn't there when my grandmother passed a few years ago, um, that was my childhood home in a lot of ways. It's where I went to high school. It's, she, she owned a home. It's two and a half acres in the redwood forest with a walk down to the river and there's fruit trees. It's just like a little slice of heaven. And uh, my dad was the legal heir of half of it. And I, and I could have came back and, and fought for it. <laughs> but I said, Lord, I already made a decision to to follow you and to come after you and to not live for these temporal things. And I was, I was so tempted. I was so tempted to say, I need to put my mission on hold. Probably gonna take about a year, but I'm gonna come back because I would really love to have that house. I'd really love to have that property. I still would really love to have it. Right now, I'm thinking I would love to have it, you know? <laughs> but the Lord said, that's not what I called you to do. I didn't call you to live for those things. I'm asking you to trust me to live for something eternal. And I remember when my grandma said, I don't want you to go. And I said, I love you, Grandma, but I believe the best thing I can do for me, for you, for my whole family is to obey God because God is all-powerful and all-wise and he is good. And if he is those three things, I should not look at my current circumstances and situations and say, I'm gonna make a decision off of what I can see. I should say, God, you are so much greater than me and you know everything from the beginning to the end. So I will not depend on my own sight. I will depend on you and I will obey you. And I said that and she definitely didn't agree with me. But I left. And then I came home about five years later and I was telling her about the mission field and I was telling her about these things and it was always a little bit tense, you know. 
as I'm getting ready to leave, she, I said, uh, she says, will you pray for me? And I said, sure. And I left and I walked out the door and got in my car. And I got my, I went, wait a minute. I think she meant something else. And so I get out of my car and I come back and I said, were you talking about what I was just talking about with like people believing in Jesus? She's like, yes. And like praying to receive the Lord? She said, yeah. That's what I said, did, did you want me to pray like right now? She said, yes. And I prayed for her. And I, and I prayed for her to receive the Lord. And then I got a call during COVID and she said, yeah, I'm really sick. And I said, well, I'm gonna be there in about four months. I can't wait. She said, oh, I can't wait to see you. I just wanted to call you though and tell you how much I love you. And I said, okay. And she was dead the next day. And it hurt me so deep, but I said, Lord, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I didn't live for the things that I could see. I'm so thankful I didn't depend on my own understanding and my own, you know, all these temporary things in the house and the property and, and this and that. But I said, you are God and you know best and you are good. And so I am going to obey you and I am going to follow your call on my life because I trust you, because I believe in you. I don't know what would have happened, but I, I have great hope now that when I get to heaven, I'm going to get to rejoice with my grandmother. We're going to be praising the Lord together. That doesn't happen if I live for the temporary. It happens when we decide to trust in God, when we have that deep conviction in our hearts that he who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, and he's going to raise us up and that he is good, and that he is God. So this, this verse right here, I have to keep telling myself this, that thing every day. God, help me to not look at the things I can see, but help me to trust in the things that I can't see. Help me to believe that, God, you are good, that you are powerful, that you know everything, and that you love me and my kids, because now it's not about my grandma. Now I have these four little kids and we're adopting our fourth right now and she can't travel to the States and that means that we don't get to see grandma and grandpa as much and I'm here with my oldest daughter because my wife can't travel with me but I try to take one of the kids with me as I can go and it's not an ideal situation. I wish my whole family could come. But my wife felt called, especially her, to adopt this little girl. And as we're doing this and we're living in Peru and you know, adopting a child and doing these things means we're gonna be in Peru for a significantly you know, just extended period. And we just have to say, God, we believe that you are good. We believe that you are real. So to close this out, guys, there's a calling on our lives. God loves us. He loves you, but he loves this whole world. And my encouragement is to not live for that 40-minute flight, but live for eternity and trust that obeying him and following him is the greatest thing that we can do for our lives and for those that we, that, that we love. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I don't know where everybody is at right now, but I just want to pray for the people in this room. I want to pray for anybody who's feeling weary, who's feeling tired. I pray that you would help them to see how much you love them. I pray that they would experience your love and your grace in their hearts. They would know that you are merciful and that you would help them to lift their eyes, Lord, to see the glory of this ministry, of, of this gospel, this ministry of the Spirit, seeing lives changed and transformed and going on for eternity, God. Encourage your people today, Lord. Help us to know that you are with us, God. Give us strength to move forward and to follow you with boldness and with courage. And then I just pray for those who are thinking about maybe God is calling me to something more, that you would encourage them that, that you love them, that you are a living God that speaks to us and that they truly can trust you, that they would not depend on their own understanding, that not, they would not depend on what they can see, but that they would believe and trust in the living God who is our Abba Father, God. Encourage your people today, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. We have gone through so much as you have on your mission field. And if we're not reminded of who is in control, we are going to become immensely fearful, intimidated, and discouraged. Jesus Christ has all authority. Guys, the enemy wants to isolate us as missionaries. 
He, the, the, one of the greatest tools that the enemy can do when you go out on the mission field is to isolate you away from the assembly of God's people. 